All right, we're here. We're live. Sort no of. Video. No video back from back in the 1880s, Hunley. Uh, no, there there was no video. I, I looked around, allegedly, everyone. Sorry, running a minute late. Uh, I'm dragging this thing around, so <laughs> it's not what the uh, hell? fun times. Uh, yeah, I found out that a, a wet deck in the East Coast with like this weird algae is a bad deal. So I went walking out. My feet went out from under me. I landed straight on the wrist and managed to break my first bone in my life at age 52. Wow. You lasted that long? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I planned to la last my whole life. So things didn't go according to plan. Wow. Let's hope it's set. Did they set it? They haven't done anything with it. It's in pain right now. All they did was put a giant ass splint on it. I see a hand surgeon tomorrow. So two, two, I guess two days, three days into it healing, I hope they don't have to re-break it or something. That would really, really suck. What? You, yeah. I the X-ray looked like a clean break, so maybe it looked clean. So I'm hoping that 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 just sitting there and keeping off oh, of it's fine. We we'll have to get Doctor Drew in on this. So uh, I see <sighs> that where yeah. we would just discuss. Hunley's hand. <laughs> I, I'm sure he has all the time in the world. No, he, he has no time, but he loves doing this stuff. I, I don't know how he finds the time to do anything. He had on Tulsi Gabbard yesterday. I mean, I saw that. And then he was on a cruise to, to Greece. I mean, I don't know. I can barely get to Albertson supermarket and get home. This guy's all over the planet. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there you go. There you go. Actually, on that note, I noticed that I don't have our display names here. Here we go. Oh, um, I've hey. been pushing it lately. I am very into what Elon is doing. I know he's not 100%. Um, there are people out there, but I can tell you firsthand that I'm hearing from people who's ha had their accounts restored. And just today, somebody who had like a 3,000 follower account restored. So it's not just big, big names. There are a lot of people who are getting restored left and right. And well, right now, that's probably the best I can type one handed on my phone is on Twitter. So I'm at Hunley Eric if you want to follow me there. And if you want to follow Mark, he's at Lord Buckley and always has either wisdom or snarkiness or Wait a whatever. Minute. I, I just post some articles. Don't drag me down to that level. But we got to get on with this show, Hunley. I know you got a lot of other things but, to talk about, but we got to get on with this show. That's why the people right. are here. Is there anybody here? Are people I don't know. Watching this? How many no, people? Five hundred twenty-five who claim to be. Okay, so these five hundred twenty-five people. What do you mean we're not on Rumble? Oh my! Uh, somebody said we're not on Rumble. Maybe we're not. Oh boy! All right, let me see. I might have messed yes. something up, but we'll find out. He's on narcotics, so please bear with us at this time. Yep. All right. Probably may have to rob an old lady to get the pocketbook money to get more narcotics. Yes, and meanwhile, you can start giving a background while I try. Oh, to yeah. Well, he's fussing around with Rumble. Let me just tell you where this thing is. This is uh, about the assassination of Garfield in 1881. But there's so much more to this story that I stumbled onto that is one of the craziest stories of all time, because uh, this is the Gilded Age. This is a weird time post-Civil War, uh, which is based on the spoil system and Grant and, and was president, and we're going to get into that. But just to go back to Garfield, who was an unbelievably brilliant savant. Apparently, he's born in a log cabin, the last of the log cabin presidents, Eric. And he is, uh, his father, there's a fire that's about to engulf the entire uh, uh, farm that they live on. And his father puts it out, but is killed in the fire and is raised by his mother in total abject poverty where the two of them are trying to grow, uh, and a couple other kids, trying to raise uh, crops uh, in total abject poverty. I mean, and I mean poverty. Okay, Rumble should be going now. I see us talking. Okay, so we're talking on Rumble. Welcome, you Rumbleites. What are Rumble people called? Rumbleites. So- oh, ra uh, Rousers, Rumble Rousers. Rumble Rousers. I like that. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> so this kid, this James Garfield is apparently a brilliant savant uh, who is ridiculed in uh, elementary school for being completely impoverished and not having a father. And he talks about how some people in poverty uses the badge of honor 
and he despises being impoverished. So his mother takes her life savings of $17 and gives it to him to go to college, to pay for one year of college. I guess $17 paid. That's a lot of money then. It's probably the equivalent of like $800 or $600. Or sure. Something. Yeah. So it pays for one year of college and he goes to college and he just goes berserk reading every book on the planet and he can't afford the second year of college. So he becomes the janitor of the college and he's cleaning out the latrines while going to college and he becomes so enormously smart and educated and such an incredible orator that they make him an assistant professor of the college. He's wow. now teaching Greek uh, romantic languages. He's teaching history and he's teaching all these subjects. And eventually this is him. He he's this is an incredible photo because he becomes such a great orator and and he he's almost, you know, like six feet tall, 190 pounds. And women are throwing themselves at him. And he uh, it, it does not turn away. Let me just put it that way. Oh, he, yeah. <laughs> he does not turn away. And he beca becomes a teacher and, and of the school. And he meets a girl named Lucretia Rudolph, who is completely introverted, completely the opposite of him, the shyest girl in the school. Her father, however, there she is on the right. I think this is, both of them are about 17 in this photo. And the, the her father is one of the benefactors of the school. So she comes from a lot of money. Mm -hmm. He comes from abject poverty. And he asks her to marry him. Um, and she, th while they're engaged, he has multiple affairs. And um, <laughs> right. Yeah. So they get married. He goes on the road to become a politician. In six years, she says, I've only seen you for a total of six weeks wow. uh, in this marriage. And the marriage is so bizarre. He's telling her to loosen up. And she is really uptight around him. She will not relax around him. She's very introverted. She's very, I hate to use the word frigid, but, uh, you know, this is oil and water, the two of them. He is a sexual animal, uh, James Garfield. Everybody looks at him at the old bearded guy. Because and even as the old bearded guy, he's still one of the youngest presidents ever. I mean, he dies in, at 49. So it's him mm. and JFK are the two youngest presidents in American history um, up until that time. But the reality of it is he goes on the road and then the Civil War happens. So he puts together a regiment out of Ohio. He, he's uh, they're from Ohio and he goes to fight in the Civil War. And he fights in major battles and becomes a brigadier general. He <clears throat> fights in Shiloh and uh, Chickamauga and is a spectacular general, becomes a major general, like Eric was explaining to me, is the equivalent of a three-star, Eric? Two-star. A two-star. So he becomes a major general, and he's drafted by the Republican Party of Ohio to run for Congress but he never leaves the battlefield and becomes the, <laughs> this is incredibly insane, becomes the congressman of that district in Ohio while still in the battlefield. So he gets a telegram from Lincoln and Lincoln says, look, I've got a lot of generals, but I need your vote in the house. And he says, all right. So he gives up the, the battlefield general and becomes the representative of a certain area of Ohio uh, either the 17th or 13th congressional district. I'm not sure it's been uh, uh, changed since then, but he he goes into the House where he remains for 17 years in the House of Representatives and becomes one of the most influential, famous congressmen in the history of the House of Representatives. He is involved in every piece of major legislation. Sounds like Johnson. In a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, except he's a true believer. Right, right, right. From day one. He, Less corrupt. <laughs> no corrupt. He's the anti-corrupt congressman. He believes in abolition even before he's a congressman. He believes to end, he goes to battle to end slavery. That's all he cares about before he's even in the Union Army is to end slavery. Uh, and he becomes a born-again Christian. He has an incident. 
he goes to work on the on on the Erie Canal, uh, pulling the mules that are pulling the ships through the canal. He falls into the canal off of the ships, almost drowns, has an epiphany that God has a bigger plan for him. Everybody was having epiphanies back then. Uh, <laughs> so he has an epiphany and then he's born again and is baptized, I believe, at the age of like 18 or 19 and be becomes mm. a theologist. Uh, and in, term in terms of uh, being an actual preacher, goes around the region preaching uh, uh, the word of God. And this is before he gets into the army. And once he's in the army and he, he, there was an incident that happened to him where after a battle, he walked into a, one of the early battles, he walked into an open field and saw hundreds of men sleeping, but they weren't sleeping. They were dead. Mm. And he commented on that, that he never saw life again like that after seeing those 20 year olds laying in a line dead. It changed his whole perspective on life. Um, and the sanctity of life. Let me put it that way, according to wow. him. Yeah, yeah. Blew his mind. So anyway, he becomes a major general. He goes into Congress, and he's involved in legislation uh, uh, around suffrage of African Americans in the South after the war. You know what I mean? And, and, and trying to keep the Union Army there. But unfortunately, the Rutherford B. Hayes-Tilden race which we talked about briefly in the election episode, in order for Hayes, the Republican, to defeat Tilden, they had to secure these three Southern states. And in getting the three Southern states and the, the presidency for Rutherford B. Hayes, the deal was made to give up the troops, the Union troops in the South who were protecting African-American uh, voting rights. And mm. the South was very smart in, from their world to get the Union troops out of the South. And that allowed them to run their own uh, Democratic elections down there. And I mean Democratic with a small d, because mm -hmm. these were all Democrats. And the, the South went completely Democratic after that. That's how the uh, Democrats took the South, because the Republicans after the war ran the earth. They had two thirds majorities in both houses, the presidency, and the South couldn't vote. <laughs> so yeah. you kind of it helps when you cut off half the country and say, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. we'll take two thirds of both houses and the presidency for a while. Uh, however, Grant, which is um, I'm getting to Grant, not that Grant was corrupt, but there was so much corruption around Grant. And this corruption was based on the spoil system. And I have to explain this because the whole story hinges on this idea. There was no civil service. The spoil system was a system where each president got into office and everybody got the spoils of war. So Grant, uh, uh, over his, his two terms, the, the level of corruption was so high that it was intolerable for anybody. And it was succeeded by Rutherford B. Hayes. And it was also the battle that was about to ensue in the election of Garfield. And this is why it's very important. It, it, it's the center of this story. The, the, just to so understand, okay, the president today, if a president's elected today, he gives out through actual appointments about two to 3,000 jobs, Eric. Today, mm -hmm. this is like our time, two to 3,000 appointments. And that includes, you know, like we know, ambassadorships. All the staff, uh, chief of staff. All no, the no, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking oh. about ambassadorships and that crap. No, no, oh, no. Okay. I'm not talking about that. Those are regular jobs that are paying jobs and, and people have to be confirmed. I'm talking about weird jobs that they give out. There's about okay. two to 3,000 that the president gives out. In 1880, it was 80,000 jobs. Okay. Jeez. That's right. Now, Dude, rap, how, how would you have time? That would be your full-time job, just giving out jobs. <laughs> you just answered your own question. <laughs> For three months, when a president gets into office... All he does is see these people who come to the White House and are waiting out the door online every single day for three months. Try to understand what I just said. For three months, 80,000 people show up for a job. And I mean, ambassador to France, head of the train lines, secretary of this, secretary of that. All of them are online. All of them helped you win the election, right? But there's people in different levels who are nobodies. 
And sometimes they say my congressman is vouching for me. And you go, okay, who's your congressman? Well, my congressman is from New York and he's vouching for me. And you go, okay, that's good enough. But as people show up every single day for these jobs and they're seen by the president himself or the secretary of state or the secretary of war or somebody who gives you a job. It's just unbelievable. This was before civil service. And one thing that Garfield was known for was enacting after his demise, which he started, civil service reform. And that's mm. when the spoil system ends. Now, the, the reason I'm mentioning the spoil system is because it's part of the story. There's a guy named Roscoe Conklin if you, from New York State. Roscoe Conklin, uh, C-O-N-K-L-I-N-G, if you have a picture of this guy, um, is the most powerful man in the United States of America. Nobody knows his name. This is a guy from upstate New York who was the senator of New York, uh, was a congressman before that. Um, there might be another later picture of Conklin. This is early on, but we're going to get into his early. Yeah, this is him at the peak of his power. So Conkling runs the spoil system. Conkling not just runs the spoil system of New York. He runs the customs house. In, in downtown New York, 55 Wall Street. And 55 Wall Street, the customs house, has all of the tariffs that are coming in to the New York Harbor. New York Harbor, this is the customs house and 55 Wall Street, still there. The, the tariffs that were paid, there was no income tax. A third of the revenue of the United States came through this customs house from foreign shipping that docked at, in New York Harbor. The revenue to run the entire country came through here. That was run by Roscoe Conkling. It was the most important spoils in the United States. And he ran it during the Grant administration, ran it through the Hayes administration. And his underling, his underling who collected the tax or, or tariffs, as it were, was a cat named Chester A. Arthur. And Chester A. Arthur was a mindless bureaucrat who was owned by Roscoe Conkling. Here's a young Chester A. Arthur. He will become the vice presidential nominee for uh, uh, James Garfield in the 1980 convention. Okay, keep that in 1880. mind. 1880, I'm sorry. In the 1880 convention, <laughs> Chester A. Arthur is given this place as VP to secure New York State. New York State is the swing state of the election. The swing state. Because it's equally Democratic, it's equally Republican. Here's a photo, a, a poster of the two of them running in the 1880 election. Now, handsome there, Chester. Hmm. Yeah, Chester, uh, <laughs> very, very fat at this point, very obese, and was a, a, a literally an idiot. Okay, and he was the stooge, and everybody knows this. He's the stooge of Roscoe Conkling. Now, Roscoe Conkling was a bully. He was a boxer. He was a guy that was the inter internal bodyguard in the Senate. Well, because Remember, Sumner was beaten to death with a cane by a Southern senator. Mm. Okay, Roscoe Conkling, every time a Republican would stand up to make a speech, he would stand physical guard, Eric, in the Senate over the gar a guy speaking to prevent any Southerners from caning them to death again. Conkling was a boxer. He, he was from, like I said, he was up in Utica and from Oneida uh, 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 County in upstate New York, around Schenectady, around Utica, which people in upstate New York know where it is. But it's going to come into play later in the story because he's not a New York City guy. He's an upstate New York guy. So Roscoe Conkling hates the guts of James Garfield. He, they are arch nemesises, and I'm going to tell you why they're arch nemesises. Because when, when uh, Garfield came to New York to make a deal with Conkling at the Fifth Avenue Hotel during the campaign, Conkling did not show up. And he allowed Arthur to do his negotiations for him. And in that negotiation, there were some other people there as well. It was said by Arthur that, that Garfield had agreed, if he wins the presidency, to give the Customs House as part of the spoils, again, the same guy who's running it, is Roscoe Conklin. And that was the deal that was made in that hotel room. 
at the Fifth Avenue Hotel in 1881. Now, uh, that was disputed later and becomes the meat of their feud. He says that Garfield screwed him. And he comes into Garfield's office during the spoils when Garfield wins and says, you're giving me the customs house, right? And Garfield screws him and says, I never said that. Now that, my friend, was was brutal to, Ro to Roscoe Conkling because you're talking about the most powerful man in America. And Garfield did this to him to end the spoil system. And he says, I never promised you the customs house. And there's some debate historically as to whether he did or not to this day. But getting back to Chester A. Arthur, who is his man, he's put on the ticket because of that. And magazines around the country saying are saying, God help us if anything ever happens to Garfield. <laughs> I swear to God, the Nation magazine, the Nation actually wrote, it, it, Garfield's very healthy, nothing, God, please don't let him die. And they're going like, well, he's 48, what could possibly happen? But And you look at this picture, and Garfield needed New York to win the election. And he does win the election based on New York. So this is kind of interesting, because now... The people that the, the the people who wrote articles, they were there was the the group that Arthur represented was called the Stalwarts. The Stalwarts were the enemy of the half breeds. The half breed. This is a fight within the Republican Party. Just, yeah, I have to explain this because it's a complicated story. The Stalwarts were stalwart about the spoil system. Mm. That's what they wanted. They were stalwarts. What a perfectly ironic title. Yes. Though, yeah, because stalwart is somebody who's honorable and fighting right, for honor. Right. They were honorable about honorable. this one system. No, yeah. no, the, the system itself was not even considered corrupt. You got to understand uh, something. It was not considered corrupt. It was considered to be the system that everyone used. They did mm. not consider it to be corruption. So anyway, the half-breeds were the other side, and that was the side of Garfield. And they wanted to end this system of uh, the spoils. Okay. So what happened was, when, you know, they were fighting over this thing uh, through the campaign. Garfield is not the nominee. Garfield goes to the convention in Chicago and it gets deadlocked. 35 consecutive ballots day after day after day. And he comes out and gives a speech, Garfield, saying, what are we going to do here? He knows every single person there been a congressman for 17 years, knows every delegate personally, right? He goes, what are we going to do here, people? Who do you want? And some guy yells out in the back, we want Garfield. Out of the blue, one of the delegates, completely spontaneous, unplanned, and all of a sudden, over the next two days, the 36th ballot, the, the, the delegates begin to shift from zero to 390 delegates to Garfield and gets the nomination. Wow. Completely spontaneous, having no planning. He didn't want it, never campaigned for it. He gets the nomination, tells his wife, uh, I guess I'm going to be the Republican nominee for the presidency. And he goes home to Ohio, does not campaign at all. He's on his porch, this is the way it was done back then, <laughs> on his veranda, thousands of people keep showing up every day. African-American choirs show up. Thousands of people on trains, Republicans, all assemble in front on his front lawn, which is large, to hear him give speeches. And he's a great orator. So there's no problem. He's one of the best orators in America. So he gives speeches about abolition. Uh, you know, obviously it's post-slavery, but he gives speeches about uh, uh, African-American suffrage and taking care of them. And we're not finished with the war and all this stuff, and he's the nominee, and this is the way he campaigns. So he Two offices, in other words, you're saying, that he didn't really campaign for. Um, in Congress, they just plucked him and said, hey, yeah, you know what, you'd be good for it. Boom, congressman, president, almost the same in, thing. In fact, his whole life, he's told, why don't you get off your, your duff, and if you did a little politicking, you may win this thing, and it wasn't in his DNA. <laughs> He was he he wasn't ambitious, but he was brilliant and he knew everything. He became a lawyer. He had he was in a law firm. He did all this incredible stuff. And and he was not a guy who was that ambit. Not that he didn't want the job, not that he wasn't qualified for the job. 
he just had his own way of doing it. So they came to him, thousands of people, and he goes to New York and they on Fifth Avenue, they have a Republican headquarters on Fifth Avenue. They're running his campaign for him. He doesn't even know who these people are. I mean, he knows them, but I mean, he's not interacting with them. And he goes to New York and there they are. He meets them and he gives a speech before 50,000 people and, you know, on the uh, in front of this building. And lo and behold, he somehow goes to bed, wakes up and he's the president of the United States <laughs> during the election. And they don't steal it. There's no mail in ballots. People go around. And, and what delivers it, the, him the election? New York State. And that was the final uh, a ticket to get him over the top. Uh, it, it was that close. He runs against a guy named Hancock, by the way. Um, yeah, that that's, that's his vice president. But the, he ran against a Democrat named Hancock. Right. Now, the, the country is so dr over the Democrats because all you got to do is raise the bloody shirt, although it wasn't working as well anymore because it was, you know, 15 years after the war. But they would still do it saying, mm. you want the Democrats? You want civil war? Huh? And they go, oh, no, no, no. It was their Trump. You know what I mean? If they go, oh, OK, we're not going there. So it was still effective, even though it was 15 years after the war, because, I mean, that was like, you know, think about it today, 2005, you know, 2007. You know what I mean? It's pretty recent in terms of the Civil War. So sure. anyway, so he begins to go through the spoil system of, of people showing up for positions in the government. OK. So who shows up? Roscoe Conkling. And he says, I am expecting my spoil, sir. And he is told by the president, Garfield, there will be no spoils for you. I'm giving it to Joe Blow. So <laughs> Conkling literally gets into a shoving match with him in the Oval Office. And he just mm. says, oh, no, no, no. It. He flips out Conkling. He's a violent man. And he he really lets him have it because he's known him. He, he He's also he ran for president Conkling. He didn't get the nomination. He was a senator, you know, the biggest senator. I mean, it'd be like the equivalent of McConnell. You know what I mean? Today. I mean, this guy was huge. And and he is told that he can't have the number one spoil that he's had for so long. And he flips out. So what does he do, Eric? I'm going to tell you what he does. He resigns his seat as a United States senator, thinking that the New York Assembly and, and legislature is going to put him back in, uh, like raise him up saying, we really need you. Mm. And, and it doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen. And Arthur tells him not to do this. Arthur says, don't do this. And he goes, I know what I'm doing. He's arrogant. He's smug. He's cocky. He says, I am so powerful that if I resign my seat, which is front page news, every paper in the country, it's just a huge story. And it's a battle to the death between Garfield and Conklin. And just keep that in mind because it's going to play into this story. OK, so he's he's about to he's tired of doing this uh, interviewing. So he wants to go to the Jersey Shore. Um, this is Garfield summer. Right. And 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 it's you know he's he's going to go to the Jersey Shore meet his wife. Uh, they have a house there on the beach. Blah blah blah. So he walks with a guy who's his uh, Secretary of State, who was also part of, you know part of his campaign. He gives this guy the Secretary of State uh, a gig, uh, Bain, uh, Bl uh, Blaine, and and he walks with another guy, who is his Secretary of War. Now this guy, the Secretary of War, has the the odd fact of being the witness to three presidential assassinations this oh. one guy this one guy I know who it is yeah i know you know who it is but it's robert todd lincoln now robert todd lincoln is secretary of war he gives him that job uh which later will be changed to secretary of defense but still secretary of war even though there's no war uh robert todd lincoln accompanies him to the train station in washington on on sixth street and uh, so and what's his name's with him? Secretary of State and the cabinet's going to eventually meet with him at the summer uh, retreat. So when Robert Todd Lincoln is there, 
he's not only been there for his father's assassination, he's going to be there from the kid for for Garfield's assassination, and 20 years later, he's going to be in Buffalo with McKinley's assassination. Now, I'm not a conspiracy guy, but if you want to live, don't take Robert Todd Lincoln with you to anything if you're the president. However, there it is. So there's a guy hiding in the ladies' room. And this guy comes out of the ladies' room and Garfield uh, gets out of the carriage and he walks into, he's got his two sons with him, by the way. He walks in, the guy takes his gun, shoots him from behind, hits his arm, and then he, the second shot goes into his lower back and buries itself into his abdomen really deeply. Uh, the guy who's Charles Gateau, uh, this is a, obviously some sort of reenactment of it by the newspapers, but um, the guy, Charles Gateau, is immediately apprehended because there's cops around and they're going to get him. There he is. There's a rumor about, um, uh, there's Gateau. There's a rumor of a second guy who was with him fled out of a side door. And the conspiracy rumors begin immediately that this is a conspiracy to kill Garfield. So if this has any echoes to uh, Oswald, let me just tell you this. The, the thing that the government first does is they apprehend Gateau and they send out a telegraph message to all the heads of state. There is no conspiracy. I swear to God, you can't make, I, Eric, you can't make this up. They telegraph immediately within 30 minutes to all the heads of states of every country in the world saying there is no conspiracy. This is a lone nut who was apprehended. And he is nuts. He was apprehended. And the whole thing is OK. Um, we think that the president is going to live, uh, by the way. He's laying on the ground and he says, what is this? Now, Charles Gateau, which we're going to get into later after I explain what happens to Garfield, Charles Gateau, the reason people are suspect, yells out, I am the stalwart of all stalwarts. Mm. My, my friend, my friend, Chester B. Arthur, is now the president. Okay, that's, it gets you thinking, because... Yeah, uh, that, that, that okay. might, might, might raise some eyebrows. Okay, well, we're going to get back to him in a second. But let me just get back to the president, Garfield, laying on the ground. Twelve physicians show up immediately and they start they they put him on a horsehair blanket. They take him upstairs. He's conscious and they start sticking their dirty fingers into the wound. I swear to God, every doctor shows up. Go, Hey, let me see. Maybe I can find the bullet. Hey, I got this thing on me, this metal rod. Let me stick that in there. They just start sticking things into the into the wound, including their dirty fingers. Now, keep in mind, Lister, who later will be named Listerine. Who, who is a British doctor who comes up with the germ theory of, of medicine. It's been 20 years since Lister, the British uh, uh, doctor, has come up with the germ theory. And the American doctors are saying, nah, we don't think so. 20 years, 15 to 20 years that this has been implemented. The American Medical Society doesn't buy into it. So neither do any. Here are the doctors sitting around. That's it's Dr. Bliss on the right. These are some of the other doctors. None of them believe in Lister's theory of germs. They believe in the miasma theory that there's something in the air. That's the, the theory of medicine in the United States. So we will now switch after this to the belief of, of Lister uh, about germs uh, infecting wounds. But as of this time, this guy, Dr. Bliss, shows up. And you say, well, who's Dr. Bliss? His first name is Dr. What? Yeah. His, Dr. Bliss is Dr. Dr. Bliss. He's been disbarred by the Washington Medical Association, D.C. He's lost his license in Maryland. He was a, in Civil War. He was with Garfield. He was a surgeon or a butcher, more like it, in the Civil War. He, he then goes to jail for accepting bribes in D.C., he gets out and he rushes to the aid of Garfield, who is an old friend who he fought with or, you know, was a surgeon under in the Civil War. And he begins to manipulate the entire scenario around Garfield. He boxes out every single doctor around Garfield. He wants this case to restore his completely defamed reputation, which he deserves. 
because he is a quack, my friend. This quack boxes out everybody, including the White House doctor, and tells him that, which is true, Garfield gives him permission to be the doctor. Mm. Bad, bad choice. He not only is a butcher, he is out for himself from day one. He isolates the president from his family, from the cabinet, from these doctors and everybody else and takes over the entire situation. And because of that, Garfield, uh, they cannot find the bullet in Garfield. This guy keeps, now he's feeding him rectally. He's giving him alcohol and bourbon, uh, alcohol and, and, and morphine through his rectum. And also, you know, he loses, he's a 220 pound man who goes down to 130 pounds in the course of this. He's actually starving to death and he's covered with, um, he, he, he's covered with sores because he's getting sepsis and inflammation and the wound won't heal because this nut, Bliss, Dr. Dr. Bliss, mm. keeps sticking his finger in there and trying to find the bullet. And so the wound never heals and pus is draining out of it. Uh, this is, I guess, uh, that's later on when he dies. That's in New Jersey. But going backwards a little further, they bring in a guy uh, from the Navy who, a couple of guys who invent, this is unbelievable. They invent air conditioning just because of Garfield. In other words, it's the summer, it's boiling in DC. The Navy engineers invent a system of fans over ice in the White House and lower the temperature by 22 degrees in the, in the White House, inventing it for Garfield's benefit. This is the first time air conditioning has ever been used. They invent it for this purpose. Keep that in mind. They then bring in a guy who is named Alexander Graham Bell. Okay, well, that's much, much later. This is a 32-year-old Alexander Graham Bell. That's a 92-year-old Graham Bell. But the 32-year-old Alexander Graham Bell gets an office across from the White House, right? Now, what does he do? He invents from scratch, like the uh, 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 air conditioning guys, he invents from scratch because of this incident a metal detector. I, he, I, you can't make this up, Eric. So he goes in and he's got the metal detector and it's a system of clicks when, when this, this, like the phone, he listens on a receiver. When you hear clicks, you're clicking on metal. So he brings the device in. So Bliss says, I'll take it. I'll take that. And his assistant goes, look, this is really complicated, bro. You can't do it. He says, don't tell me I'm in charge, right? <laughs> so... Bliss takes the metal detector and Bliss keeps insisting to the newspapers. The newspapers are running medical updates three times a day, Eric. The entire country knows what's going on every single day. This one of the upsides of this story is that it, the country was bitterly divided until now because of the Civil mm. War. This unites the United States for the first time after the Civil War. Both Southerners and Northerners start having prayer vigils. The entire country is locked in on this story for the first time since before the Civil War. The one thing that Garfield's assassination does is it breaks the spell of the split in the United States between the South and the North. Because all of them begin to have prayer vigils for, for, for uh, Garfield. Uh, he mumbles that his, fa his favorite soup, I, I guess I have to tell you this, is squirrel soup. So these two teenage girls kill their pet squirrel and make squirrel soup and send it to the White House. Because God knows when you got a bullet in your back, nothing goes down better than a bowl of squirrel soup. There so he, he gets the squirrel soup and he eats it and he likes the squirrel soup. But Bliss, with the, with the metal detector, goes on the left side or the right side of the body. The bullet's on the left side. And he keeps saying to the newspapers, the bullets on the right side. And he's, again, insistent upon this. He's so insistent upon this that he will not let Bell or himself examine the left side of the president's body in fear of being wrong about where the bullet is. Wow. Yeah, that, dude, that's how crazy this effing guy is, Bliss. Bliss single-handedly kills the president by his medical malpractice. Now, granted, 
that was the the period of of really poor medical science but he is a fraud even in that time period he's a fraud and but he's loyal and and garfield's loyal to him so he has to leave bell with this device knowing it works knowing it works he's tested it on other people who had metal in their body he claims so he knows it works uh is that the early bell yeah yeah that looks like him right okay so he now leaves and now bliss continues to solidify his hold over the situation and there's times when garfield actually sits up and talks and has a couple of people come in from the cabinet so Okay, where is Chester A. Arthur? You don't know, uh, do you? Okay, you're not alone. Nobody knows where he is. He goes into hiding in an, an, in an estate in New York City in a brownstone, and nobody knows where he is. He's drinking around the clock in hiding. He's not, there's no 25th Amendment. He's not president. There's no, mm. they're looking for him. A New York Times reporter gets a lead that he's in this mansion on like 25th street or something. And he goes in and it's all covered with sheets and the owners had gone away to the Hamptons or Long Island for the summer. And he is alone. This is the vice president of the United States is alone drinking in this place for over a month. Nobody knows where he is. <laughs> That's what a kind of coward this guy was. So he says, sir, uh, you know, the, the president is, is, in a state of he can't function. And he says, he's still the president. I am the vice president. Now get out. Kicks the New York Times reporter out. So he is suspect. The American people believe there was a conspiracy to kill Garfield. I'm not uh, the only tinfoil hat in this room. <laughs> the people in the country, because of the fierce hatred between Conkling, Arthur, and Garfield, and the statements by Gateau are fueling conspiracy. That's why they sent out that telegraph around the world. Okay. So he now is saying, I have to get to the ocean, right? I want to get to the ocean. He's dying. He, he can't be helped any longer. So the doctor, Bliss, says, I can't move you, sir. And he said, I am not asking you. I'm telling you. He wants to go to the sea to uh, New Jersey. Why New Jersey? Well, that's in Long Branch. That's where he goes and has summer mm -hmm. vacations. So they take the president. They put him on a special train. This, this is a really moving part of the story. Thousands of people line up along the train uh, tracks, throwing straw onto the tracks to, to quiet it and to reduce the sh amount mm -hmm. of shock in the train. Thousands of people are doing this all along the train. Wow. No, no, wait, it gets better. The train doesn't go all the way to Long Branch. Overnight, thousands of volunteers are building the train tracks to the estate in Long Branch. There's no tracks. They're building it overnight, thousands of Americans who are building the tracks. So the train, which is going like, I don't know, 20 miles an hour, gets to these tracks that are freshly built to go to the estate in Long Branch that's on the water where he's going to die. And everybody in America knows this. The train has to go up an incline. It can't make it. Thousands of Americans begin to push the train. Jesus. Hundreds, hundreds of them, of the thousands who are laying the track, begin to physically push the train car up the tracks to get to the house, which they do. Wow. They unload him. They unload him. They put him in, in a bedroom overlooking the beach. And he's in there now, still alive still alive and this he lingers and finally after all of this stuff of everyone you know coming to see him and everything else he finally passes away and the entire nation is riveted to this storyline hour by hour by hour because of the telegraph what they did was the newspapers around the country would put up billboards you know president eats food right and they go oh he's eating food president's temperature rises to 104 this was instantaneous. This was instantaneous. The second he was shot, within an hour, the entire country knew that he was shot because of this system of the newspapers putting these billboards out in front of their buildings. And then they'd write the articles. Okay, so he now passes away and Arthur be, is sworn in as president of the United States. So the whole time, 
This guy, Gateau, has been in jail. This guy, Charles Gateau. You say, well, who is Charles Gateau? They go, he's a lone nut. He's literally, he's the original lone nut. Look what he looks like, Eric. His mother was nuts. His mother had been in a mental institution. She died when he was like six or seven. And his father beat the living shit out of him um, mm. because he stuttered. And to beat the stutter out of him, his father, and they came from some money. His father had government jobs. His father had money. He inherits $30,000, which was a lot of money back then. And he you know, becomes a, a born again. And he um, joins a community. This is in, I want to say, 1860. He joins a community. Here's where the story gets weird. Because Gateau is a, a guy who is looking for, you know, to become famous, but he's also a guy searching for stuff. So in 1860, he joins a group called the Oneida community. The Oneida community is a photo of him here in upstate New York, Oneida, New York, is the one of the first communal socialist free love societies in America. They believe in what's called uh, noise, N-O-Y-E-S, is the leader. And they're a Christian socialist group, hundreds of members, and they have a thing called complex marriage, which is really like free love, Eric. You know what I mean? They raise the children. So polygamous like Mormons? Or early no, Mormons? no, no, no. They're not married at all. They're oh. just, it's a free love society. They work. They all work according to their ability. Uh, Gitto joins this group. And his father writes the letter to get him in. This is like a revered group. I mean, that people want to get in here. They will make products. They have over 200 to 300 employees working uh, for this organization. They create, and the ladies at home know what I'm going to say, is Oneida Silverware. Everybody knows on, that came from the Oneida Socialist Free Love Society up in Oneida, New York. So this guy stays there for about five or six years. and. They eventually he's he's so, you know, unusual that he they have these criticism sessions where the whole group, it's kind of the Weather Underground did this, too. They where they critique you, Eric, and they call you they call out your foibles and your shortcomings in a group. Mm. So Gateau had to sit through this uh, as they all did. And they kept saying you're narcissistic. You're smug, you're arrogant, you're, you think too highly of yourself, whatever the terminology was at the time. Eventually, Gateau leaves. Now, he comes back again. You say to yourself, well, you know, what is going to happen with Gateau? He's not a complete psycho. He comes up with the idea of a news service which would take the telegraph of the news and transmit it to the other cities around the country and the world which would later become the news service we now know today. The Wire. The Wire, right. He comes up with that, invents it wow. himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He then opens up a newspaper. He goes to New York City. He gets married. He brings his bride to New York. He has a number of ventures. He, he goes back to Illinois. What does he do in Illinois? He passes the bar. He becomes a lawyer. This is a lone nut, Eric. Just This is why I'm saying this. This is the lone nut that they say was a psycho. He ain't no psycho, bro. This is, this is yeah, office for your life. Right. Okay. So just to get into Gateau a little bit more deeply, he, he invents the telegraph thing. He gets the $30,000 inheritance and he goes to New York and he goes to that headquarters I was telling you about, the Republican headquarters. He writes a speech for Garfield and he gets the speech printed and he passes out the speech for Garfield against Hancock. And he goes in and he meets all these bigwigs, including Chester A. Arthur, in the uh, headquarters, the Republican headquarters in New York, where he hangs out with them week after week. And who's in there? Roscoe Conkling's in there. Who else is in there? Well, a guy shows up to make that deal I told you about. And that deal is made by Garfield with Arthur over the spoils. So who he gives a speech. To 50,000 New Yorkers that night, Garfield, right? He gives a speech that I told you about. Who was the opening act for that speech? Charles Gateau. He, on the veranda with Garfield, gives a speech to 50,000 New Yorkers, the speech that he wrote for Garfield. You're not going to find that in the history books because they try to paint this guy as a lone nut. 
This guy who may have been crazy, he wasn't that crazy, gives a speech right before Garfield gives a speech. OK, so later on, he he says, look, uh, you know, I helped you get elected. He shows up at the White House. He shows up at a party and meets Lucretia Garfield's wife and gives her his business card saying, I am Charles Gateau. And she and she says, your husband, I want to be the ambassador to Paris. There's the wife. The wife ends up getting um, either malaria or typhoid from the swamp in back of the White House, which is a completely separate incident. But getting back to Gateau, Gateau is listed in the actual article in the New York Times listing the luminaries who are at this event, Eric. In the article, it lists Charles Gateau with Garfield, with Arthur, with Roscoe Conklin. So he may be a megalomaniac, but when you see your name in print in the New York Times with those people, you may go even further, Meglo, right? Because, I mean, he just gave a speech to 50,000 New Yorkers. I mean, it's a, nobody tells you this, but it's true. So he'd anyway, be like, he'd be like Jack Dorsey in exactly. with all these other people in a weird way. Right. Okay. So, and he has a law degree. He does come from a, 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 an upscale family. He is a little bonkers because his mother is a little bonkers. Some people said he got syphilis in the um, uh, um, Oneida community because of the free sex. I don't know about the syphilis, but the reality of it is, did Conkling somehow use dog whistles? When, when he is arrested, he has a packet of editorials in his pocket. In those editorials are one newspaper after another calling for the removal of James Garfield as president. He's not, he's not just taking this out of thin air. These are dog whistles by the stalwart newspapers in the United States calling for the physical, physical removal of Garfield because he's trying to end the stalwart system and he screwed over Conkling. So he clips all these, Gateau. He clips them all and he puts them in a packet and he has a letter in his pocket saying why he's doing this. And the letter is completely lucid, saying, I'm doing this because Garfield screwed us over and we were the ones that delivered New York for him. Absolutely true. The question is, was it a conspiracy? Was it a conspiracy to get this guy to kill? And this is not out of bounds to kill Garfield, to make Chester A. Arthur the president of the United States. This is one of the letters. I'll put these on locals, by the way. I have the original letters, which we'll post to uh, uh, locals, unstructured locals. So anyway, what could be the connection between Conkling and Gateau? Well, it turns out Oneida County, which is up there by Utica, has a district attorney back in those days. And what was the name of the district attorney where the Oneida County uh, was? District attorney was named Roscoe Conkling. Who is the, then be, no, no, dude, you can't make this up. Who becomes mayor of Utica? Who becomes mayor of Utica, the, the, the city at where Oneida community is? After he becomes a DA, this man, Roscoe Conkling, becomes the mayor of Utica, New York. You can't make this up. He's literally 19 miles from where uh, 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 Charles Gateau is living with the Oneida community. The Oneida community is based around a night in New York and Utica is right next door. Yeah. I heard the uh, word, you um, Oneida earlier when you were talking about Conkling, you kind of slid it in there. Right. That was intentional. Right. I know. So it turns out he's the district attorney, bro. I mean, okay. <laughs> he claims Gateau claims to know Arthur Conkling and everybody. And he does, whether he knows them or met them, you know, in, in, and maybe Conkling, was smart enough to keep this guy at arm's length and but Chester Arthur isn't because he knows he knows Gateau and Gateau comes up to him gives him the speech he they then give him permission to give the speech at the Republican uh, rally in New York so is it a dog whistle is it a conspiracy I don't know did they take a lone nut and push him in the right direction I mean dude I mean there's a lot of meat on this bone Eric not one person has ever mentioned after they put out the fire of conspiracy, which is sweeping the country because of what I just said, not the, not the stuff about Conkling being the DA up in Oneida, because that was not known to the general public. That's something I've researched on my own. 
you know, that he was the DA and based out of there. I had a feeling about it. So I started doing a deep dive on Roscoe Conkling in the past. That's why I need some time to put these episodes together, because that was new to me. I had a funny feeling that these two cats, because I knew that I knew that Gateau, who the girls called Get Out <laughs> in, in the in the uh, uh, Oneida community, because they didn't want any part of this guy. Uh, but he was in there for six years. He misses the entire Civil War, by the way, and he's having uh, all kinds of sex. He claims with three different girls, but um, whatever happened, happened, you know, uh, while he was in there. He may have gotten syphilis, maybe not. But the idea that he's two inches away from Roscoe Conkling and then becomes a stalwart of stalwarts saying, my friend Chester B. Arthur will now be president is a little bit much, if you ask me. And not only that, other people in the country believed there was a conspiracy to kill Garfield because of what he did to, to Roscoe Conkling. And Roscoe Conkling was not just a two-bit congressman. He was the most powerful senator in the Senate and in the United States. So, dude, it's just a weird, weird piece of the story. So what happens? He says, now that, now that um, Garfield is dead, he's charged with murder, right? So in his jail cell... He's giving interview after interview, photograph after photograph. He's treated like a rock star. And he says, I'm going to have this trial. My friend Chester Ar B. Arthur is going to pardon me or I'm going to be victorious in the trial. Look at this photo. This is what this is after he kills him. He's going to run for president, he says, in 1884. Guiteau. He's going <laughs> to go on. No, no. He's going to. He says, I'm going to get out. I'm going to go on a speaking tour. By the way, he goes to a gun store with the money he borrows to buy the most expensive gun he could get. And he buys this British Bulldog uh, handgun. If you got a picture of this gun, uh, the British Bulldog revolver, he spends like 15 or 20 dollars on it. There it is. And he whoa, gets whoa, the 15, 20. Oswald's gun was how much? Like fifteen dollars in that real Sorry, time. I wanted yeah. to point that out it was within 100 years later or whatever. Right. But this is the top gun at the time. This is the, and he buys the most expensive gun, unlike what Oswald does. He buys the most expensive gun. Why? Because he says it's going to end up in the Smithsonian. <laughs> and there it is in a museum. So he says, I have to have a good looking gun, which he buys. And he gets like 10 bullets from the guy and he goes down to the Potomac, never shot a gun in his life. And he's just starts shooting the gun with the 10 extra bullets that he gets to, you know, get the feel of a handgun. So, uh, you know, he's arrested with the gun, smoking gun. It's, it's just, you know, too much. So he goes to trial, but before, while he's in the jail cell, he gives interviews. He writes a play in there. He, no, no, no. He writes a play. He writes his autobiography. A guy's taking notes. A, an author comes by, sits outside his jail cell as he dictates to him his autobiography. This is this is and he's in the Washington City jail. So he you know, he goes over. By, he's being guarded by a small group of soldiers outside the courtyard because the prison is surrounded by thousands of Americans who want to lynch him. He's the most hated man in the since Booth, the most hated man in America. So just to just so to point out, they look there's still no protection for the president, despite if, Despite the Lincoln assassination, they believe that to be an aberrational part of the Civil War. There's still no protection. It will not happen until McKinley is killed 20 years later. Then they finally wake up. So Garfield just walks around, you know, like Lincoln did. They do not think anyone in the United States will kill a president. They believe that that was an aberration because of the war. So anyway, so he thinks he's a hero. He believes that he did the right thing because Garfield screwed everyone by dismantling or trying to destroy the spoil system. So he goes to look out the window, and there's a group of six uh, guards with rifles who are guarding, or six or 12, whatever. Um, and one of the guards says, ah, screw it. And he aims and he sees Gateau in the window, and he shoots a bullet, and it misses Gateau's head by an inch. Right. <laughs> he tries to take out Gato and the crowd cheers, but he misses him. But he's just looking out the window with the bars. So he shoots and he almost gets him. The guard, the guards arrested. Ironically enough, the guard pleads insanity and he is uh, uh, beats the charges. He pleads temporary insanity. He gets off the guard attempted murder. So that's a story for another day. 
But anyway, so Gateau is giving all these interviews. He has to go to trial. So he goes to trial. So he gets his brother-in-law from Illinois to show up and be his defense counsel. And he is the co-counsel because he's a lawyer, right? So the whole thing goes on for months. It's a, a total, total shit show. Goes on for 72 days. And he's hmm. quoting the Bible. He's making, he's passing notes to the people in the audience saying, what do you think I should do next? He goes on the witness stand and he defends himself in the cross-examination, which I have a copy of. I'm going to read a little paragraph of the cross-examination just so you know what we're up against. And and the the jury's there and they just, I, I don't even know how to explain this, so I'm just going to explain this. They bring in the actual skeleton of Garfield to pass around the jury in the courtroom. The skeleton, the vertebrae and the bones of Garfield are brought into, now this is October. Garfield's dead in September. The trial's in November, right? This is two months later. They're bringing in the bones of the president to, you know, to, to have the, the jury. Now, okay, so his whole defense is that God made him shoot the president and God talk, didn't speak to him, but God, the deity, told him to kill the president and there's nothing he could do about it. And he was doing an act of God and God told him to do this. So the cross-examination, the guy said, did God tell you to do this? Did God tell you to do that? And he gets into this whole biblical debate with the prosecution and his, his other co-counsel is trying to plead insanity. And he's saying he's insane too, but he, he's being picked apart by the prosecution who says, did God tell you to buy the gun? And you got to do this. And that's the whole cross-examination. It's, it's really fascinating. And I'm going to put it up on locals uh, when we're done. you got to read this. It's really lucid uh, on both sides because he's not a – he's an attorney, and he's debating in real time that God told him to do this and how it, he prayed over it for two weeks. And he says, what about John Brown? John Brown said God told him to free the slaves. He went and got his sons and he went to uh, uh, Harper's Ferry. And he says, what is, and he, and also what about Garfield? Garfield has an epiphany that he is going to be famous when he survives falling into Lake Erie off of one of the barges and almost drowns. He thinks that he is uh, uh, stuck, uh, struck by the hand of God. And, and Gateau is on a boat in Connecticut, uh, a steamship collides with another steamship 80 people die and Gateau lives and that's his white light experience years before. So he believes he's touched by the hand of God. All of these people claim good and bad to be touched by the hand of God. So Gateau makes this argument saying, who are you to say I wasn't touched by the hand of God? He cites 38 times in the Bible where God tells men to kill other men because he's an expert on the Bible. And I don't know if it's true or not. But he says this repeatedly in the courtroom and the judge says, look, we've heard you say this 20 times already. OK, we get it. <laughs> the judge, <laughs> dude, it's the craziest trial of all time. So in the cross-examination, he explains how he has to kill Garfield. He doesn't want to do it, but he's got to do it so Arthur can become president. And he wants the spoils of war. Now, what happens to get him to shoot the president? He goes 15 days in a row to the White House, Eric. He meets with the Secretary of State repeatedly, this guy Blaine, who finally tells him, you're not getting the ambassadorship to Paris. He then meets with a guy who he shows the speech to, right? He then meets with a guy and he shows him the speech that he wrote and the speech that he gave, and he wants to be the ambassador to Paris. Now, who is that guy? The guy he meets with, is President James Garfield of the United States of America. He has a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Garfield, and Garfield says, that's an interesting speech. I remember this. And he says, I helped you, which is the system. This is the system. He is better than most, not as great as others in terms of what he deserves, Eric. You know <laughs> what I mean? Because he does work on the campaign. He does write these speeches. He does give these speeches. And based on the system of that day, he should have been given something. And I don't know if he should have been given the ambassadorship to Paris, but nevertheless, Garfield says, I'm going to look into it, son, right? 
And he goes, thank you. And he leaves. He leaves. This is meeting with the president of the United States. Now, I don't know what lone nut assassin who has a wife and, and, and a law degree and meets with the president and is working on his campaign, giving a speech with the president, is considered a lone nut assassin. But that's how they painted it. So in the trial, the last thing they want to do is paint him as a nut because they're trying to tell the United States of America and the press, which is, is doing this, that he's completely sane. He's completely sane. Right. But and his ego is now in a spot where he's saying, yes, I'm sane. I'm a little crazy, but I'm also touched by the hand of God. OK, so I just want to read <laughs> tiny, a tiny bit of the transcript of the case. Right. OK. Of the, This is him on his own witness stand. It says um, the prosecution. Did you state truly in your address to the American people? What was the cause for which you intended to kill him? And then he reads from his letter, from this is from Gateau's letter, quote, because he proved a traitor to the men that made him and thereby imperiled the life of the republic. Uh, a question from the prosecution. That was the idea. Uh, uh, that was the idea. The question, um, he, he says that was the idea. Question, you stated that the reason you shot him was because he proved a traitor to the men that made him. Gateau interrupting. I never should have shot the president on that account. I want you and the American people and this honorable court and the jury to understand it. I say the political situation and the deity pressing me into the act resulted in the shooting. Question. Did the deity tell you whom he had been a to whom he had been a traitor? Answer. That was the result of my own judgment. Question. You say today, owing to the misconduct of the president and the secretary of state, they could hardly carry 10 northern states. Uh, uh, Gateau, that was true, and I can prove it. Question, what was that conduct? Answer, that was the conduct of, misconduct of the president. He had gone back on Grant and Conkling and Arthur, the very men that carried New York and without which he could not have been elected. And he then put himself right under the influence of Mr. Blaine. Question, suppose he had appointed Senator Conkling Secretary of State, then you would not have killed him? Answer, that is a supposition that I do not care to discuss now. Question, have you any objection to telling the jury whether you would or would not have killed him in that case? Answer, in that case, they would not have got into any such snarl and the Republic would not have been imperiled. And question, and consequently, you would not have killed him? Answer, no, sir. Uh, this goes on and on quite lucidly by the two of them discussing the politics of why he killed Garfield. And it was about the preservation of, of this thing for Conkling. So if you could connect Conkling to this guy, you've got a case here. You've got a case. But that's not what they do in this trial. He's put on trial, you know, for, for talking to God about killing the president. Jesus. <laughs> but it may have been the first political conspiratorial presidential assassination in American history. But we've already discussed another conspiracy just 15 years before this in the massive conspiracy to kill Which Lincoln. is about spoils, by the way. Again, a Again, different kind of spoils. Right, right. Again, so it's not inconceivable to think that Gateau, that they, these guys from New York, instead of getting a booth, an, an ideologue to do it, booth being super famous at the time to kill Lincoln, they get this lone nut. And I believe this might have been the origin of the lone nut killer, Eric. This I believe this is where it came from. And yeah, it's a bunch of smart guys in New York who came up with this. And I think that might be the model for later on. Well, on that note, this uh, cartoon that I keep pulling up was an article about him being the forgotten assassin. So it works right. absolutely right. perfectly to lone nut and obscured and pushed out. Right. In fact, the entire story is pushed to the historical uh, back burner. And that's not an accident either. He is just depicted in U.S. history as a lone nut. And look, look how much dope I just gave you on this storyline. Look what I just gave you. And if, this is not what is in the history books that's left for us to look at. We are just told that some nut shot Garfield for some crazy reason. And we don't know what that is. And he says, I'd rather be hung as a man than acquitted as a fool. And they build these gallows for him 
right there are the gallows that are designed for him. His appeal is quickly. Uh, by the way, the trial took uh, 72 days. The jury goes out and they're back in, I want to say, mm, seven minutes. <laughs> no, no, I swear, seven minutes. So in seven minutes, he's convicted, you know, he's, he's found guilty and sentenced to hang. And he says in the trial a quote that lives on to this day and people agree with. He says, the doctors killed Garfield. I merely shot him. And mm. that, my friend, is agreed to by every historian in this case. They said that this type of wound today, a person would go home in two days from the hospital. And that the doctors did this, specifically Dr. Bliss. And he <laughs> said, I should. In other words, it's like shooting a guy in an assassination attempt in the arm, and then he dies from gangrene. And it kind of reminds me of the Siron case. Yeah, I thought of that too. When you... Right. I mean, he shoots Paul Schrade in the head, but he doesn't shoot Robert Kennedy, who's shot by someone else, namely, uh, allegedly, Thane Eugene Caesar. But yet Sirhan does the 56 years in jail and Thane Eugene Caesar gets a home in the Philippines. So, wow. right, Eric? That is insane. It's totally insane. But it may, not, it may you know, be the type of, uh, of thing that they foresaw. You know what I mean? So before he goes to the hanging, he writes, a, like I said, <laughs> he writes a play and then he writes a poem. And he makes a deal with the hangman that to let me read my, I don't know how they made these deals, but he makes a deal with the hangman to let me read my poem, which he requests a full orchestra to provide music for him reading the poem, which I respect as a performance spoken word artist with a musical band in back of me. <laughs> I really, he, he may have been the first spoken word artist in American history, um, having done that myself. It's much better with music. So he has the poem, he requests the orchestra, they turn down the orchestra, but there's dozens of people who come to see the hanging. It's inside, you know, inside the uh, uh, the building. It's not in a yard like what was done. The the Lincoln one was done outside, in the, outside but still they, they were up seeing it. Was it was like there. inside of a wall, but it was inside the fort. Door. It was inside yeah. the fort, the courtyard of the fort, and everybody else was hung with him. So, okay. So the appeals are gone. He has the poem. He just wants to read the poem. And he says, I'm going to read the poem. And I, I'm going to read the poem now because that's what I like to do is read poetry on this show now. It's become a thing. But I, I can't make this up. It's the last words of the assassin. Um, I think uh, Stephen Sondheim would later do a musical called The Assassins where somebody contacted me on Twitter and he played the part of Guiteau in the play, The Assassins on Broadway, and in the play, Sondheim put this to music, and the guy sent me a video on Vimeo of him singing this, which I'm now going to read, which becomes immortalized. This is so crazy, uh, wow. the play Assassins. So let me just read this, because it gets a little weird, okay? A little. These are the prisoners' last words. This is June 3rd, uh, 1882, right? And this is actual words. I am now going to read some verses which are intended to indicate my feelings at the moment of leaving this world. If set to music, they may be rendered very effective. I, just a suggestion, but apparently it's not going to happen today. Okay, the idea is that of a child babbling to his mama and his papa. I wrote it this morning about 10 o'clock. So he, he now reads this in a high child's voice as the child babbling to his mother and father as he's leaving the earth. He now raises his voice to this high-pitched voice of a child reading this, and everyone in the audience is like, what the F is this? So I will now read that, you know, for historical purposes. Okay. I'm going to the Lordy. I am so glad. I am going to the Lordy. I am so glad. I am going to the Lordy, glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah. I'm going to the Lordy, glory, hallelujah. I love the Lordy with all my soul. And that is the reason I'm going to the Lord. Glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to the Lord. I saved my party and my land. Glory, hallelujah. Now, keep in mind, this is in a high-pitched voice. But they have murdered me for it. 
And that is the reason I'm going to the Lordy. Glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah. I'm going to the Lordy. I wonder what I will do when I get to the Lordy. I guess that I will weep no more when I get to the Lordy. Glory, hallelujah. I wonder what I will see when I get to the Lordy. I expect to see most glorious things beyond all earthly conception when I am with the Lordy. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. I am with the Lord. And with that, he drops the paper onto the ground, uh, onto the floor, and the sandbags drop, and he's hung by the neck until he was dead. But don't worry, Mark. He hasn't gone away. He's because, gone to the Lordy, that's for sure. Yeah, but uh, his skull hasn't. It can he be either has his brain. Did you see the jar with his brain in it? Yes, I did. Yeah, no, I do. They kept everything because they wanted to explore what made the, there's his brain. <laughs> everything about this case is crazy. It's totally insane. It really is. That's why I needed a, a week or so to really drill down because there's so much to this case on both sides, on the Gateau side and on the Garfield side that have been put on the back burner like it's it's the crazy uncle story you don't talk about even for the holidays you know what i mean like this is on both sides of americans dark america's dark untold stories this is one of the best i've ever you know come upon you know the fact that they passed around garfield's bones in the trial the fact that they saved this guy's brains to be examined in the future i mean which could determine if he had syphilis or not. So, I mean, some of these questions, they actually could find out if. I, I agree. I mean, both Garfield and Gateau were chronic masturbators. I mean, both of them, this is by, by everybody's admission, both of them were touched by the hand of God. Both of them were deeply religious, zealot level Christians. I mean, there's a lot of similarities between these two of them. Both were lawyers. Both, you know, married uh, women who were very timid. I mean, there's a lot to this um, of similarities of these two guys. I mean, it, there's a lot of weirdness about this story uh, between the two of them. But Garfield, because he, the people say he might have become the greatest president of all time and should not be uh, disremembered because of that. I mean, his destruction of the spoil system is what he's known for, but his brilliance... Um, he only had 200 days, so he did a lot. Right. He couldn't do it, but his leg, his work lived on after the 200 days. First, he had to meet out those jobs. Um, but after that, legislation that he did before Eric, you know, during the, during the Civil War, lived on. He was there for the signing of all the different amendments to the Constitution. He was the leader of those amendments that, that were done from the Civil War. He was the guy that came up with those. I mean, it's more than just his presidency is what I mean. It's wow. more than just, I mean, he was the, the best and the brightest of the United States at that time. He was obviously a savant and was able to, uh, you know, learn music. He came up, he took a trapezoid at one point, a trapezoid, the shape of a trapezoid, and proved the Pythagorean theory of mathematics just for fun, just for fun as a side thing, as a mathematics freak. Uh, just playing so he around. He was goodwill hunting on his way to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he just said, "Oh, I like trigonometry. Let me take a trapezoid and and see if the Pythagorean theory is 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 true," uh, which he did. Uh, Pythagoras, uh, Pyth Pythagoras, yeah, Pythagoras, Pythagorean theory. Uh, but it was Pythagoras, the, the mathematician. So he proves that, you know, like somebody with one of those Rubik's cubes, you know, while he's on the toilet. I mean, the guy was brilliant. This guy Gateau robbed us of someone who was probably going to be a two-term president, gave us Chester B. Arthur, who was adult, uh, who comes in and becomes president. But uh, ironically, Chester B. Arthur is visited by Roscoe Conkling, and he tells him to go F himself. And he turns his back on Conkling, who never mm. really got to the level of power that he had before Conkling. Mm. So it's an interesting uh, 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 battle of power and wits in the American political world at that time of the Gilded Age. And because of this, when Arthur becomes president, the American public turns their back on presidents as American heroes and begins to shift their sights for the first time in American heroes to um, industrialists, 
capitalists, sports mm -hmm. heroes, and other heroes outside of the presidency for the first time in American history. And it's never really restored uh, to the way it was before Garfield. Interesting. And when he goes to back to his uh, Ohio, Garfield, the people who turned out for his funeral was more than turned out for Lincoln in Illinois. That's how revered Garfield was. Wow. I guess and as I said, one of the one of the side things was um, gelded. Yeah. One of the side things was it united the country uh, from the north and the south for the first time after the Civil War. Amazing. Wow. Whew. OK. <laughs> I hope somebody got something out of that, but no, I, I think so. Jeez, craziness. We got some super chats out of it too. Um, really? Yeah, I got a few. Uh, this is from way earlier. Uh, hey, Eric, never mind Dr. Drew. How about Dr. Oz? He's not doing anything now, is he? <laughs> well, you could get him on, or I, I, no, yeah. no, no, no. Posh is a, a good smart ass. I like him. Smarty Matt. Love these older American history stories. Can't wait to add these details to my class. They make it more fun to oh, teach. Oh, is this the history teacher? Yeah, Sparty Matt. Which, oh, thank right. You very much. That's right. I forgot about this. He was the one who got his mind blown by the JFK stuff. Well, there's more untold stories, Sparty. Yeah, thank start you, Peter. teaching them about Garfield, bro. Yeah, no, this is cool stuff. I mean, um, every <laughs> Pasha, every week, I wonder if this will be a slower, calmer episode. Nope. I'll say to Mark, what might be your personal connection to this one? Is Nothing. I have no I had no, no, just New York. I mean, just growing up in New York um, and living in upstate New York, I guess, is a personal connection. I mean, these guys are long dead, but just, you know, learning about the Oneida Indians and the Algonquins as a kid. I once made an, an Iroquois longhouse to, for show and tell. We learned I mean, if you grew up in New York, you learned a lot about um, the uh, Indians in, in New York state. And this was up where Oneida was where this happened. Plus, I learned about the Oneida community a long time ago when I was looking into the Moonies and stuff. Very cool. Um, I think you could do a great lampoon on his poem scene, Mark. I love it in his eyes. <laughs> Dude, it, the, the poem's great, but the, the, I, I want to put up the uh, transcript of the, uh, of the, um, yeah, that'll be on locals. So. Yeah, that'll be on locals. That, that is really interesting to read. And thank you. Um, by the way, thank you, Sergey, for the super sticker. Um, let's see. Great story today. Thanks for the in-depth info we only get from you. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Speedbag Static. Hmm. Um, Dan Davis. Great story. Thank you. And I haven't seen anything on Rumble. Nope. I'm nope. interested in, in having a bowl of um, squirrel soup. I just want to see if anybody knows that because... Um, I've had rabbit, but not squirrel. Oh, you've had rabbit. Okay. So I, I forgot I to grew mention. up on it. He go, Garfield goes to New York and he meets a girl who's 18 years old named Lucia Gilbert Calhoun, who worked for the uh, New York Herald, and he has an affair with her. And he comes back and his, he tells his wife he had an affair with her. And she says, go back and tell her you're done. And he does. And uh, the 18-year-old says, I don't care. I already married a doctor. But at that point, their love of uh, Lucretia and her and the death of the three-year-old daughter, Trot, which I showed you the photo of, really mm. cements their marriage for the first time. The daughter dies of um, some illness. And um, that combined with the um, breaking up with these different affairs. Yeah, there's the daughter who is three. Look at this picture, though, Mark. This picture is from the 1800s. And look at the depth and the clarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. a hell of a picture. Yep, yep. And that, that really cemented their marriage was the loss of that child at the age of three uh, between him and Lucretia and also him getting rid of these um, extra fillies who were in his periphery. That, that women tend to appreciate it when they're... Yeah, he went back and ratted around. himself out. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of manly. Wow. All right. Well, on that note, we are in the support matrix Obviously, support I'm injured, nation. so I, I have my emotional support, Oswald. Emotional support, Oswald. That's right. See, we got the matching T-shirt. Look at that. Little little Hunley and Big Hunley. Yeah. And Mark. Oh, uh, there's mine back there. There's my bear. Dude, somebody yeah. did a meme of this this discovering of the of the bear in a cavern or something. He put it up on Twitter. Uh, no, so, you have to share it to me. Yeah. Well, thank you, JS. I hope to uh, meet you in person someday. We did meet a few people in um in met Dallas. A lot of people, but we should have a meetup somewhere um, in the middle of the United States sometime. Maybe next year 
at the 60th, but we should meet before then. Should should be have, nice. Before then. Yeah, help the show grow, everybody. Remember to subscribe, and uh, that'll help us uh, oh, come up with something. Oh, Yeah, we did see a little bump, didn't we? Um, that's always nice. That's always yeah, nice. no, we, we definitely we have seen a bump. Um, locals is, is growing like crazy. Everybody, please consider checking that out. I think you'll find some interesting things. I <laughs> actually have finished... The uh, first G Jim De Eugenio, Jim De Eugenio part of the interview that I'll be putting up uh, within a day or two. Oh, Probably this is like a good one. This is me and him just riffing. You know, I mean about this one goes I mean, into the we're not making commission. a joke out of the of the assassination, but we're riffing no. about various parts of the assassination that only people who know really know about, and yep. it's kind of a shorthand thing that only knuckleheads at that level seem to know about and me and him are like you know two schoolboys just comparing notes about this and he how fast does he correct me if i'm wrong <laughs> and i you know at some point i slip slip up a couple of things and he's on me like so quick you know like, and rightfully so he's yeah. a teacher though he's a teacher he's, a professor. He's, much sharp, he's sharper than i am you know oh look at that georgina thank you georgina so what is going on georgina I knew a little because I'm from Ohio. Oh, okay. People okay. from Ohio seem to know a lot more than I do about Ohio. So, yeah, he's one of the Shockingly. seven. No, 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 but he's one, the history I'm talking about. He know, he's one of the seven who came out of Ohio. I, I, I am not an expert on Ohio history, and I should – presidential history I'm talking about, Eric. And, and Well, Grant's out of Ohio. Or seven Illinois. of them are out of Ohio, bro. I mean, there's or a big seven. Illinois uh, or Ohio or both? Ohio. I, I, Ohio. Grant? Okay. I, I think I, I think he is. Oh, oh that's right. Lincoln is Illinois. Grant is Illinois, Illinois. Illinois. And this guy Gateau passed the Illinois bar. And you say, well, how tough can that bar be? There were three questions. He got two right in the Illinois. <laughs> I swear, there's three questions in the Illinois bar exam. He got two, so he became a lawyer in Illinois. So yeah, it, okay, I found that odd. Maybe there's five questions in New York. I'm not really sure, but I guess. But yeah, anyway. Thank you again, Georgina. Your wonderful, so. wonderful, okay. wonderful support. Um, you too. Um, on that yeah, note, I mean, on that note, what, what do you got? Something else, or what, what's the deal? No, no, I'm just going to announce that next we have Free Form Friday oh with my. Barnes. Oh my! This I don't know if it. it's Viva and Barnes or if it's just Barnes, but well, maybe we can ask him about that thing that we saw yesterday, that uh, bizarre <laughs> episode on Tim Pool, and some other stuff you may have questions about, Eric. Yeah, I mean, on that one, I, I didn't want to go there today because I knew this was going to be a lot. Of no, stuff that's episode. a freeform thing. Okay. Yeah, I just knew this was a crowded episode today. I wanted to get it in because I thought about doing this in two parts, uh, Gato and separate with this guy. But I think we got oh, it all. Grant, Grant Illinois. Illinois. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. The, um, yeah, it's really interesting. You know, these books that are keep flowing in from the book fund really help getting these older books on these subjects are because I, I i don't getting it from the library is it takes a long time and i i need to move quickly so the book fund is really advantageous to me so thanks for that you know to get these books quickly overnighted to me um and eric um says that the locals thing is really starting to boom again which is great yeah it's it's definitely picking up i deeply appreciate it i mean We've this, this Wallace episode has gone berserk apparently from what eric said I yeah, mean, fifty something thousand people watched it. I mean, that for us, that's great. a lot. I don't know what other people get, but for us, oh, 50, what two rumble rants? Oh, Krabby T Girth. <laughs> go ahead. What is it? It's Krabby T Girth. We always like okay. the names. Got here late. I walked to watch from the beginning. Hello to both you guys. And the other one is Mark. What is your feelings about the framing of Leonard Peltier? Uh, it's a complicated subject. I don't know how framed Leonard Peltier was. Um, there's there's guilt on both sides. Let me put it that way. If we ever do an episode on Peltier, I'll get into it. But uh, he doesn't cool. have he doesn't have clean hands. Um, anyway, you know, part of the reason we don't Thank get that right many here. followers is, I mean, you look at the thumbnail that Eric made, which is beautiful, but nobody knows what we're going to talk about. The people who have faith in the show seem to jump on, and they always say, "I'm glad I looked at this thing. I had no idea that it was going to be this interesting." And there's nothing we can do about that because Eric makes a great thumbnail, but he doesn't want to give away the story and there's not any way to really advertise it. So you just got to buy into the show and come along for the ride, you know, and so many times, right, Eric, they've said, I didn't know there was so much interest in 
you know, the Amityville Horror or... You know, I wasn't really interested in it, but I watched it and wow. Right, that was Custom good. Shop or Levine's Bungalow Colony. Look, no, the Box I, of Dreams, dude, is the, the one that... Threw right. If I'm telling the story, it's of interest to me. And that's every story is not of interest to me. I'll tell you that much. It's got to be super interesting for me to waste my freaking time doing this story. So I'll just tell you that. You are never going to be disinterested in a story. And I'm not saying this to be arrogant. I'm saying that most stories don't interest me, you know, because I'm a storyteller. And if I'm doing this, believe me, it's of interest to me personally. So if that helps anybody, because you may not know anything about looking at that Garfield um uh, thumbnail to think, well, what do I care about Garfield? And look what we learned. It was a great adventure of Garfield. We learned about Gateau. I have a degree in history and I have literally never heard. Right. Of course. That's what I'm talking about. Thanks, Sparty. Right. He only heard the lone nut theory because that's what they wanted you to hear. And look, historians will get money to write books based on what the publisher wants them to write. And if I pitch this story to a publisher, they tell, like, tell me to take a walk because it goes against the establishment narrative. These, and look how much I, I, and there's more that I couldn't get in this episode. Believe me, there's much more to this story. I mean, Roscoe Conkling deserves an entire episode. This would be a good miniseries, actually. It would be a great miniseries. In fact, I, the reason I have all this information is because I was brought in by a production company to pitch this as a, as a movie. Or, you know, and that was like, I don't know, like eight years ago or something. And then they yeah. got uh, cold feet. But I have all this information in files because I attempted to make this into a film. But they would rather make some animated thing at Disney with uh, some gay superheroes. Than yeah, but get. there's hope. Uh, you know, uh, the CEO got fired. And How many stories like this? Yeah, well, um, Padre, he did say there were a lot, especially the Kennedy stuff and and some of the other historical things that we did, the Smedley Butler, I, I'm sure he's aware of Smedley Butler, but I mean, the depth we went into the Smedley Butler. Hey, maybe this could be like Prager U. Maybe we can have like a like a history like Prager. I don't know. I've never watched any of those videos. Have you? I mean, yeah, they're about a minute to three. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. But is that a school you go to that's online? No, it's, well, is it is. It's school? just you go watch videos. It, it's videos giving right. the other side of the story or, or more education that you don't hear alternative takes so it's similar in that regard all right somebody made a video of me and eric talking about the kennedy assassination and they said i made 40 mistakes in 40 minutes and then they didn't mention one of the mistakes that i made that was the, well but he also said he stopped watching after five minutes he stopped that. watching after five some cat in britain was telling me I, with this other guy in peru they had a, a show trying to analyze the jfk stuff saying I made all these mistakes and then didn't mention what the mistakes were, which is very interesting. No, it's just everything you said. It was everything I said. They didn't even like my style. Well, they liked my style, but I talked too fast for the, for the guy in England, in Sheffield, who was an expert on the Kennedy assassination in Sheffield, England. But, well, you uh, know, you, you never take know. them up everywhere. So, okay, so Friday we got Barnes, yep. right? Okay, yep. and then maybe his sidekick, the weird uh, Harry Abby Hoffman. The the sidekick of Barnes may show up, but he's got family issues and Chuck E. Cheese issues. Yeah, it could be Chuck E. Cheese. It could you be know fishing. It could be you know kayaks. It could be chasing a cur a, a squirrel that robbed his GoPro. Is uh, that true? Was that an episode of? Uh, no, you didn't. Thing? Okay, no, he David oh. first got on the map, right? Because he smeared peanut butter on his GoPro and left it there, and a squirrel grabbed it. That's funny. went up a tree and he sold that footage everywhere. He won awards for it. No. Everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we yeah. got to ask him about that if he shows up on Friday. Yeah, That's he does funny. things like that. He uh, He's done fishing with a drone. Oh, that I've seen. I think I've seen the fishing. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. I went, fishing. Crazy I went fishing with a drunk one time. It's kind of a similar thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, all right. So we got something to live for, you're saying. Absolutely. But you know what? We have locals in the meantime. You're going to be uploading stuff. Uh, I'm going to put transcripts up on Locals if you want to join us um, on Locals. It'll be fun. Yep. Because and the uh, gym story. stuff's coming up. Uh, C um, Cyril Wecht is there. We've got oh. a tipping expert that was there. Ooh, I mean, there's expert. yeah. I mean, there's a lot that's happening, and we really appreciate it. Yeah. It us immensely. Okay, so we'll see you Friday, right? If see everybody more, Friday. More and and I'm going to go five. take drugs and pass out. Yeah, I'm going to put my pajamas back on. This is great. Perfect. Perfect.